So, Moya, thanks so much for being here today. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first official episode of Astrolennials, yeah. and one of the reasons that I think that this video series is important is because, um, for a few different reasons. One, the space industry is commercializing very quickly, and the general public is being exposed more and more to the space industry. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I've personally found is that there's so much that we take for granted, not just about the world around us, but also what exists in outer space. And there was the really interesting Event Horizons announcement where they finally released the first image of a black hole. And within that announcement, certainly the general public learned a lot, but there were also some controversies around who's responsible for what part of the imaging. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that that showed me is that there are actually a lot of young, very smart people working on understanding these issues. And out of all of the friends that I've asked, like none of them can say that I have an astrophysicist as a friend. And most people, if you ask them like, oh, can you name an astrophysicist? They'll probably say Neil deGrasse Tyson, maybe yeah. like Stephen Hawking, who, and I, I want to get into like the differences between like astrophysics and astronomy and cosmology. Mm -hmm. But most people can't even identify a friend or somebody they personally know in this field. And it's an incredibly important field because yes, it has minutia that you really have to dig into, but it's also a very existential science. Mm -hmm. um, so really appreciate you being here today. You're definitely blazing a lot of new paths. Um, so, you know, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Moya McTeer. I'm getting my PhD in astrophysics at Columbia. I have two years left, so I'm about to start my fourth year, nice. and I am getting out in five. Like, I just, some people get out in six, some people get out in seven, but, like, I want to get mm. out as fast as I can. Uh, I study the relationship between the structure and motion of the Milky Way galaxy and the types of planets that form, and the, I'm really excited about that research because it's the question I wanted to answer when I applied to PhD programs in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, I don't think I would have applied to graduate school if I didn't have that question in mind. So. Mm. How galaxies form? No, uh, the relationship between planets and the structure of a galaxy. Gotcha. Yeah. And so why that question specifically? I don't know. I, mm. going through my classes, my astronomy classes in undergrad, it was a question that I didn't see answered. Mm. And so I, I just got really interested in finding the answer or coming up with the answer on my own. Mm. And then I, I just went forth and did the thing. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, but the, to get to that question, you had a very interesting path. So, I mean, some of the stuff that you can find on your website talks about how you grew up in a small log cabin. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, which is, which is really fascinating because it's not just, and I'd love, you know, for us to talk about your identity and role sure. in the science, but also, like, your path to getting there in and of itself for anybody is very unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I am from a small coal mining town in rural Pennsylvania. It's mm -hmm. called Waynesburg. Uh, it's, it's, like, the larger town, but I lived, I think, technically outside of Waynesburg proper in a little mm. village called Oak Forest. Mm. Um, my house was about half a mile off the road. You had to go through this big field uh, to get to my house, which was a log cabin built in the 1800s. Wow. Uh, a couple years ago, I visited my high school for like the first time since graduating to mm. give the commencement speech at my high school's graduation, and I brought my partner along with me. So he was seeing where I grew up for the very first time. Was he shocked? Yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> he had heard me say that I grew up in a log cabin without running water and I was in the middle of the woods. But I, I think that in his mind it was like like a ski lodge type mm. of log cabin. Like a, like a fancy. Glamping. Yeah. <laughs> and then he got there and he was like, oh no. Like this is, wow. this is like old school, like Abraham Lincoln could have grown up in this cabin. Uh, and he was taking pictures of like, the actual logs interlacing at the corners of the house, and he took pictures of me pumping water from our underground well, which is how we like showered and got our water to survive, because uh, we didn't have a plumbing system. And so he was just really shocked. Wow. And but, do your parents still live there, or is it still a family home? No, uh, it's pretty much abandoned now. After okay. I started college, my mom, my mom moved to the Bahamas. She's mm. an English professor, so she's teaching there. Mm -hmm. And my dad moved up to Maine to another log cabin that is equally secluded. It has running water, but mm -hmm. it still has a composting toilet. Mm. So for some reason, he just loves composting toilets. 
Mm -hmm. I don't get it. But what like, do compo composting toilets do? Like, do you take the compost <laughs> from that and use it to like oh, so fertilize? Many. Stuff? So many memories <laughs> from my childhood. Uh, I I feel like our system was so incredibly janky. Right. Uh, you would basically like do your business and. Oh, you know, I was young, and so my parents mm. definitely didn't expect me to, like, manage the upkeep of the composting toilet. But in my mind, it just kind of, like, fell to the ground underneath the house, mm. which may or may not be true. It's unclear, but I uh -huh. do remember there were times when it would leak, uh -oh. and so there would just be, like, human waste sludge on the floor <laughs> of the bathroom. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how gross I should be about this. No, like, we need was, all the details. There was a lot of, of grossness. Um, mm -hmm. Other unfortunate things about composting toilets mm -hmm. is that uh, all of the waste just kind of sits there until mm -hmm. it goes through the composting cycle um, and that creates a lot of moisture so mm -hmm. in the winter in the dead of winter when you live in a log cabin and you don't have a central heating system you would go to the bathroom I would go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and I would lift up the lid and the moisture that condensed on the toilet seat would freeze oh, immediately icy. upon contact with the air. And then I would sit down and my butt would freeze to the seat. Oh my God. It's like licking a ice pole and yeah, oh my God. Exactly. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. I would have to like yell for my mom to come and pry me off the frozen toilet seat. Oh wow. That's such a good story though. If you ever do yeah. two truths and a lie, you can probably toss one, yeah. that one in there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that's where I came from. And mm -hmm. then from there, a lot of hard work, but also a lot of luck went into getting into Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, I, and was that your first choice? Did you want to go to Boston or how did I, you decide? I did. I, honestly, I did no college research. Mm -hmm. I basically just applied to schools that I had already heard of. So mm -hmm. uh, I applied to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and then a few other schools. My top choice was actually Williams mm -hmm. in Western Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I got into both Harvard and Williams and was gonna go to Williams and then everyone, all of my teachers were so mad at me. They were like, how dare you? You have the opportunity to go to Harvard. Like I would, I was mm -hmm. the first person from my school to go to Harvard and the first in what, like 40 years to go to any Ivy League school. And so they, wow. they just really, really wanted me to take that opportunity. Uh, and ultimately I decided it with a coin flip uh, where I was gonna Ballsy. go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I went to Harvard and the rest kind of followed from there. I feel like until I decided to apply to graduate school, mm. I made very few like, conscious, intentional decisions in my life. And I was kind of just going with the flow. Like, mm. I went, I applied to Harvard because people said I should. Mm. Or actually, I, I did it because. I wrote a letter to myself in sixth grade saying that I wanted to go to Harvard. Um, and then I, I went to Harvard because mm. of a, a coin flip. And I got into astronomy because of free pizza. And mm. and I stayed there because of inertia. And, and then I just kept going with the flow until I got to graduation. And I didn't want to just be some kind, some kind of like inert person anymore. Mm. Um, and then I decided to go to grad school. Cool. I think I think the the story behind how you got into astrophysics in Harvard that's also very interesting because you mentioned your mom is an English professor, mm -hmm. and then I also you, you shared earlier with me and I've seen in your intro video on your webpage that you were learning she was grooming you to be a scientist from an early age. Oh yeah, she hardcore wanted me to be a scientist or an engineer. Hardcore, and then you also like Greek mythology, which is great. I have a feeling that I mean you probably read a lot too. I did, well, there wasn't really anything else to do in the cabin. So, but you go to Harvard, all right, this is an incredible opportunity to become a top-notch mm -hmm. scientist, which ultimately you do become, but the first major you choose to do is? Uh, physics, really? I, okay. I, I got there and I thought maybe I want to do physics, maybe anthropology. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't find the anthropology building, so I picked a physics class mm -hmm. my first semester freshman year and then had a horrible experience. Uh, we were expected to do a lot of coding and I had never used a computer as anything mm -hmm. other than like a word processor or a Netflix machine. <laughs> and I didn't know what coding was. So I went to the professor to ask for help and he said that if I was struggling that much, I wouldn't make it as a physicist. Uh, so I decided I probably should leave physics. 
uh, kind of circuitously, like serendipitously found mm-hmm. my way to the folklore and mythology department. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd always loved Greek mythology and reading fantasy books and anything myth related. Also, everyone there was really nice. They always mm-hmm. had like tea and cookies on display. And, and I, I am a woman who follows my stomach. So I, I declared that my major. And my mom was really angry at me because she, she wanted me to be a scientist. She, when I was growing up, she was an adjunct English professor, which meant she made no money. Uh, I actually make more money now as a graduate student than my mom did uh, wow. when I was growing up. And so she was really mad at me. And we didn't talk for a long time, like, on the, like a few months, really, which is hard when you are starting college sure. in a different city. And so I eventually decided to go back to science to appease her. And okay. one of my friends in the first semester of my sophomore year dragged me along to an astronomy course. I didn't think it'd be that interesting, but the mm-hmm. professor said we'd get free pizza every week. So I signed up for the course, and now, now it's just what I do with my life. And how... Well, that, you know, that's an amazing story because it, you would think that, like, once you left the physics department that maybe you began to hate science, but that wasn't the case. It was just mm-hmm. the advisor's or professor's approach in telling you, like, in teaching you, effectively. Right. Yeah, I mean, my mom had instilled in me a deep love of science and, mm-hmm. like, the, the process of coming up with a question and then kind of systematically trying to find the solution or mm-hmm. the answer. And... I wanted, I didn't want to abandon science, I just had been told by a well-respected physicist that I didn't mm-hmm. have what it took to be a physicist, so I, I was looking for other options. And I think that's something that would be great to get into in a bit, because what, what people watching away for the first time might not know is that when you graduate with your PhD from Columbia, you're actually going to be the first black woman mm-hmm. to get your PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Columbia, yeah. which, I mean, it's amazing in and of itself. You almost want to be like, wait, in 2021, like, that's the first time this is happening? Yeah. But this is like, this is more than just you being a woman getting your degree in astrophysics. This is, I mean, it's a whole different journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate that we're able to say things like that now, that mm-hmm. like, it is going to be 2021 and we can still say that there's going to be the, the first black woman to do anything that other people have done before. Like, I, I really want to live in a world where I, I am not the first to do anything. Uh, but I recognize that I have a lot of, not power, but like, it's, it's a, by doing this, I can open the door for other people. For sure. Uh, and so that's what I'm, what I'm trying to do. And I want to talk about that in a little bit, too, because I think one of the things you said about how to think like a scientist, like, mm-hmm. that's, that's one of your keystones, right? Like, so, so right now you're in the master's program. Um, PhD program. PhD program. You just yeah. finished your master's program. You're crushing it out there. Thank you. Um, but you don't want to be an academic, ultimately. No. Um, academia is fine. Uh, mm-hmm. It has its pros and cons, and some people can really thrive in that environment, but I'm not one of those people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I applied to the PhD program knowing that I wanted to do science communication to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was first applying, I thought maybe that meant getting my PhD, working at some sort of observatory or national lab, uh, mm-hmm. doing research, but having a position that's like 75% research and then 25% outreach with that institution. Mm-hmm. And over time, through the, the past three years of my graduate program, I realized that I I want to do like maybe 5% research and 95% science outreach and communication. Cool. And I think this is actually maybe a good point to educate the viewers on something that I was clueless on up until <laughs> having met you. Like there are a lot of terms in this discipline, or not, maybe not a lot, but like a lot that seem to the general public like they're intertwined. Mm-hmm. Um, astronomy, maybe even to some people, astrology. Mm-hmm. There's also cosmology. And then astrophysics, yeah. which it's separate from physics. Can you maybe talk about the difference in some of those terms? Yeah, definitely. Um, there are some people who study space who get really tied up in the difference between an astronomer and an astrophysicist. Mm. Uh, by and large, they're pretty much interchangeable. 
technically, if you want to be that type of hardo, an astronomer is a person who actually looks through a telescope to observe space, and an astrophysicist is someone who takes data and applies physics knowledge, tools, and methods to space data. Mm -hmm. uh, but no one really looks through telescopes anymore. I mean, there are, there are amateur astronomers. There are amateur astronomy associations and societies all over the country. Mm -hmm. And they look through telescopes and they do really cool things. Amateur astronomers have actually been responsible for a few really key findings in the last few years, especially like when it comes to uh, finding exoplanets. Okay. Um, or or supernovae or any sort of transient thing in the sky, something that's there one moment and gone the next. Mm. But that's not really what like research PhD astronomers or astrophysicists do. So mm -hmm. that's like a big umbrella term, astronomer slash astrophysicist, mostly interchangeable. Mm -hmm. I like saying astrophysicist because I feel like it makes me sound more impressive. <laughs> and there are a lot of times when I go into a room and I already feel like I have to prove my worth to people there, so that's how I introduce myself. Mm -hmm. If I don't want to be intimidating or if I'm talking to kids, I'll usually say astronomer. Mm. Um, another reason I usually don't say astronomer is because people get it confused with astrologer a lot. Mm -hmm. And look, I'm not gonna... You can, go, you can speak out <laughs> against it. No, I, I, I personally don't believe in astrology. Mm -hmm. Most of that honestly comes from my folklore background. Mm -hmm. uh, I studied religion and like how people form religion and belief systems and what they can do for people and why they're necessary for different things. Uh, I don't need that. I don't mm -hmm. believe in that. But I'm not going to t say to anyone else that it's wrong for them to believe in it mm -hmm. um, unless they're hurting other people or themselves with it. Mm -hmm. Or unless they like genuinely believe that it's actual science. Mm -hmm. So th those are my only two sticking points. I will tell people, I will scream from the rooftops, astrology is not science, mm -hmm. and don't use it to hurt anyone. But if if you want to use it to like, then all power. To yeah, you. go That's for right. it. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then also my brother actually, who's a bit of a science nerd, who's not a scientist himself. I told him that we were chatting, and I mentioned that you're into folklore and mythology, and he said, ask her about cosmogony. Cosmogony. Have you heard about cosmogony? I haven't. Okay. Um, but would that be like cosmology myths? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. See? Okay. Yeah. So I had to look it up also. Apparently it's a real thing, but it talks about like different societies and cultures creation stories and sort of how that mm -hmm. ties to the cosmos. Yeah. I, I did this weird double major at Harvard mm -hmm. as the first person to do it. Uh, Harvard is pretentious, and so they, mm. it's not actually called a double major, it's called a joint concentration. Oh, nice. And when you do a joint concentration mm -hmm. at Harvard, there, there is actually a pre-approved list of joints that you can do. Mm -hmm. Astrophysics and folklore mythology, surprisingly, not on that list. Yeah. And so I, I had to like, kind of like fight to do it, really. Uh, but one of the reasons is that when you do a joint concentration, you have to write mm -hmm. a thesis that sits at the intersection of your two fields. Mm -hmm. So to be able to do this joint concentration, I had to prove that I would have a valid thesis. Mm. One of my thesis ideas, I think I came up with like 10 before they approved one. Uh, one of my thesis ideas was looking at creation myths from around the world and seeing which ones were more, or like the most heavily influenced by actual astronomy knowledge. Wow. Um, and which were kind of the closest to cosmology and the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. They didn't like that. No? Uh, no. They, they didn't think it was sciencey enough. Because my, my primary was astrophysics. Mm. And they didn't think it was astrophysics-y enough. Which is interesting, because when you think about how science develops, like, at this point, sure, we have the scientific method, and there's a lot that we know about the world that we previously didn't. Mm -hmm. But if you look at recorded history and ancient societies, like, a lot of them, the foundations to what would then become scientific discoveries where it was rooted in symbolism and mythology. Yeah, yeah. So you would think that it would actually fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indigenous knowledge has provided a really important base and is still doing important work in helping us advance scientific knowledge um, in like the, the current understanding of what scientific knowledge is. I mean, that, that's really interesting that you mentioned that. I, had, I hadn't even thought about it, but you know, when we touch about the, talk about like the different, like the millennials, I guess you can say, within mm -hmm. astrophysics, like, there are generational differences, and there are differences in, like, 
it's primarily older white men. And I wonder if our understanding and conception of how we tie like things like astronomy to our understanding of the world, like if the fact that it's not the default response of the Harvard registrar to say like, yeah, I see the connection, mm -hmm. but like it's so obvious that yeah, the indigenous people's findings do have um, a strong influence on how the science developed. Like I wonder if that, that denial is also rooted somehow in I guess you can say, like, the, the whiteness and the oldness of these departments. Yeah. Or is that a stretch? I don't think that's too much of a stretch, but I uh, don't think most things are stretches when it comes to, like, mm. saying that old white dudes in science are unlikely to see progressive things. Um, but I, I think that this is an idea that is that is becoming more popular now, or it's, it's um, come to the forefront more now, especially with... Uh, all of the news surrounding the TMT controversy in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Have you mm -hmm. read up on this? Or yeah. yeah. Uh, so I actually so, wrote my thesis on the... T kind of. My thesis mm -hmm. was like a hodgepodge of a bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a science fiction novel that was set on a planet that I studied, so I got the, the astronomy in there, wow. uh, and all of the astronomy was realistic. But the plot of the story was an was an allegory for the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. Uh, and so I, I went to Hawaii and I talked to the protectors, the people who were protesting the construction of the 30-meter telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And mm -hmm. my thesis was about them. And that was back in 2016, which is the last time it got really popular uh, or uh, unpopular mm -hmm. in the news. And it's rising up again because earlier this month, it's August now. Last mm -hmm. month, um, they were trying really hard to go forward with the construction of the telescope, mm -hmm. and they actually arrested a lot of the people who were on the mountain uh, protecting the, the sacred space. Um, so just some, some background maybe for people. So this, this sacred space, this area in Hawaii, it's very elevated, and like mm -hmm. the si there are already multiple telescopes on there. Yeah, area. so the... Depending on, on which metrics you use, it mm -hmm. is one of the biggest mountains uh, on the Earth. I think from base to top, mm -hmm. not from like land level to top. It is the biggest mountain on Earth. Um, and it's really heavily involved in the like, native Hawaiian cosmology, cosmogony, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, it's, it's really important. It's a sacred space partially because it is so high up, but there are a lot of rituals that have taken place there traditionally. Sure. Uh, there are already 13 telescopes on the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, people mm -hmm. kind of point to that as a reason for, like, why can't there just be one more telescope? Mm -hmm. Well, one, like, people, it's not like people wanted those 13 telescopes there, uh, mm -hmm. but the processes in place for getting approval of Native Hawaiians, like, weren't as strict mm -hmm. in the past when they were building those telescopes as they are now. Strict. Um, but also, this new telescope, the 30-meter telescope, is huge. Um, it's, it's at least going to be, like, two stories tall. I don't know the exact dimensions, but it's going to be huge. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to displace... Yeah. It's, not people, but these sacred ritual sites where... Right, right. And it's going to be just a lot more disruptive than mm -hmm. uh, all of the other telescopes were. So how do we, like, somebody's playing devil's advocate and they say, well, mm -hmm. this is, we need this telescope here because it's going to give us the highest quality data. And mm -hmm. that understanding the universe through the data this telescope provides is more important than... You know the the ritual areas like the people can find other ritual areas which is not something i believe but I, the arguments i've seen against it are yeah the, so what can we tell them that in, in terms of why that's a bad argument uh well if you're trying to appeal to the scientists in them you can say mm. that the canary islands are almost as good a site mm. um, almost uh like equally high quality data will come out of a telescope put in the canary islands mm -hmm. uh, where there aren't people who are going to protest the construction of the telescope put there. Sure. Um, if you're trying to a a appeal to like the human in them or maybe some sort of like moral do-gooder in them, then mm -hmm. you can say, look, at the end of the day, like, these are people's traditions and cultures and beliefs and that 
doesn't pale in comparison to your scientific progress. Mm -hmm. Like science is not automatically better than culture. Uh, and then there are a lot of people who are saying that this, this isn't a fight between science and culture. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of like one of the last stands you can make in fighting against colonialism in Hawaii, mm -hmm. which has a horrible history. Mm -hmm. And uh, Americans, like people from the U.S. and, and other countries who are uh, collaborating to put the TMT there, they're they're just kind of following in the path of people who have. There's a lot of white privilege yeah. and insensitivity to the. Yeah, thanks. Words are hard. Uh, but no, no, you you described it beautifully, and I think maybe this is a good opportunity. Like again, you're when you get your PhD, you're going to be the first black woman to get your PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Columbia. Mm -hmm. I, it's it's a great achievement, but to your point, like why should this be a first now? And I found, like, I, I saw that tweet on Twitter, and it's one of the reasons I decided to reach out to you, because it's amazing, but also I started following other young astrophysicists and astronomers in mm -hmm. the space, and what's interesting to me is, is, the, is the profile, and it's very progressive, mm -hmm. very socially conscious, like pronoun identifiers in yeah. the Twitter bio, which is great, and one of the que when we first met, one of my questions was, like, is this just, like, a symptom of Twitter algorithms recommending people to me because mm -hmm. you're all similar or are scientists like one of the trailblazing groups in terms of progressivism these days a little bit of both probably mm -hmm. i mean that's how twitter works it tries to mm -hmm. show you like-minded people so that you'll spend more time on the platform but i i do genuinely believe based on interactions that i've had with astronomers in in large groups at mm -hmm. um national meetings for astronomy where pretty much everyone in the field shows up, or at least a very representative sample of astronomers show up, mm -hmm. uh, we are, especially the young people in the field, we are generally very progressive. Um, I really can't think of a young person in the field, meaning like postdoc, graduate student, or undergraduate, who mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't agree with any... The, progressive ideal that mm -hmm. anyone would name. Um, and we also, we, I mean, we spoke a little bit about how that's the case, but it's also, it's not necessarily the case across all sciences. Like, I think you mentioned um, that there's also a difference between, like, traditional physicists yeah. and astronomers, which I find interesting because it's all rooted in science, but why do you, why do you think that is? Or can you explain that to well, people who aren't familiar? Part of it is that Astrophysics is so much smaller than physics. To give mm -hmm. you an idea, there are maybe 25, maybe 30 graduate students in the astronomy department at Columbia. Oh. There are like 150 physics graduate mm -hmm. students. Um, and that's after they go through their quals process where they weed out a bunch of people. And so that's the, the size difference means that there's probably a greater number of ideologies represented in physics. Uh, another thing, and I think this is what I talked about earlier when we were discussing this, physicists tend to have a much more fixed mindset than mm. astrophysicists. When you, when you get to college, it's expected that you'll have taken a physics class. Mm -hmm. So the people who decide to pursue physics as a career uh, are the ones who got to college and were like, I'm already good at this, mm. I, I belong here, I'm just inherently good at physics, and so I will become a physicist. There's very few people take astronomy classes in high school or mm -hmm. before they get to college, and so they, uh, when they are going through that formative process of starting college and declaring a major, they are starting from a place of needing to learn more, and, and it's expected that they won't know everything, and so that draws in a very different crowd of people who are willing to learn and willing to accept that other people also need to do the work of learning this field. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that probably contributes a lot to the, the differences in the types of people you'll meet mm. as a physicist and an astronomer. In general, I think astronomers are really, really cool. <laughs> um, and I have not had that same experience with physicists. Gotcha. Yeah, well, well that makes sense. We don't um, have to like necessarily go deeper. Mm -hmm. But I, I think you bring up a really good point, which is, you know, should we be doing more to educate young people on disciplines like astronomy and astrophysics? And I think the answer is yes, and you've been doing some of that. So mm -hmm. you, you mentor young students. How I do. 
Yeah, I try as often as I can to go and speak to schools um, through through Twitter and videos that I put mm-hmm. on my website. I try to get the word out to young people. Uh, earlier this year, I went to South Africa and right. visited rural schools around Cape Town and mm-hmm. Grahamstown, which is now called Makanda, uh, on the mm-hmm. eastern side of the country. And I told them about my path into science and what it's like to be an astronomer. I think that's important work, going around and talking to young kids and getting them interested in astronomy. Mm-hmm. But people are already interested in astronomy. That's mm-hmm. one of the things that I love about it so much is that it's kind of universal and then everyone mm-hmm. is under a night sky. And even if you're in a super light polluted area, you at least know what, like you can see a star. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can kind of experience the, the wonder and beauty of the night sky, which is something you can't really say for other scientific disciplines it's not as widespread Mm -hmm. uh, and not as Mm awe-inducing so people are already into astronomy and i think the thing that i would want to focus on most Mm -hmm. is keeping people interested in astronomy Uh, people talk about the leaky pipeline and how uh, you you have there are a lot of people who are interested Uh, like women and underrepresented groups who are interested in astronomy in college, but then by the time you get to the tenured professor level, Mm -hmm. there's like a handful, right? Uh, And so somewhere along the way, we've been losing a lot of people. And some think that the way to fix that is to just get more people in at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, Because if you just increase the flux at the beginning, then you'll end up with more at the end, which is true, but I think Mm -hmm. that it's much better to just fix the leaks. Okay. Uh, And so that's what I would want to focus on. And what are some of the big leaks? that? Uh, Any sort of transition period. I think Mm -hmm. one of the biggest is... uh, college to grad school, and then grad school to postdoc is, mm-hmm. is really huge. Uh, postdocs are really hard on academics because you, you've you just spent five, six, or seven years of your life becoming an, a world expert in a field. Then you're told that you have to take a temporary position somewhere. You'll probably have to move across the country because there are so few positions available that you don't get to choose really mm. where you go. Um, if you have a family, you have to uproot them, and that's traumatic in its own way. Uh, and then you're there for two, three years before you have to do the whole process over again. And some people do that two or three times before they even get a tenure track position if mm-hmm. they decide to stay in academia. So that process is really brutal mm-hmm. and loses a lot of people. Um, yeah, so academia is hard. But but what I what I love to do. Uh, in fixing up those pipelines is getting Mm -hmm. people that were never really interested in being in that pipeline anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot of emphasis placed on, like, we need to make more astronomers, we need to Mm -hmm. get more uh, women and people of color into astronomy. But, like, do we? Like, Mm -hmm. we don't need... Mm -hmm. There's already a shortage of jobs available for the people who are getting PhDs. And, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that things should be more even Mm -hmm. and equal... Uh, but I don't think that the focus should be on creating like a thousand new astronomers in the mm-hmm. next two years. Uh, what would be great would be educating people who have no interest in being astronomers or physicists or any type of, of STEM person in how to think mm-hmm. like a STEM person. Because uh, those are the people who are going to be voting and influencing decisions that will impact the policy that mm-hmm. impacts the world. And so that that's where my focus is. Cool. So it's, it's more about empowerment and critical thinking than it is like, oh, I'm a scientist, so you should be a scientist too. Right, yeah. I'm never going to look at someone and judge them if they don't become a scientist because it's not mm-hmm. the right field for everyone. It shouldn't be. Like, if mm-hmm. we take that to the most extreme, then what, everyone is a scientist and we don't mm-hmm. have movies or music or, mm-hmm. or people running the government? Like, that's, that's not helpful. That's not a good world. So can you talk a little bit about, so do you call it your curriculum or your framework or is it, is it always evolving or what's your it method? Is, yeah, okay. it is always evolving and, and always changing and my plan for what mm-hmm. I want to do with it is always changing. Mm-hmm. Um, but in general, like in broadest terms, I, I want to help people learn how to think like scientists. And mm-hmm. so uh, all of this kind of came out of a class that I taught to undergraduates at Columbia. I was teaching an undergraduate astronomy lab for mm-hmm. non-astronomy majors, which was which was key, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I was told I have to teach this lab. I wasn't given any sort of instruction on how to teach, 
which is a problem uh, in academia, but I looked at the past labs that have been taught. We have a, like an online folder or something of all of the labs that past graduate students have taught, and some of them seemed helpful, but most of them seemed like they were really only useful if you intended to become an astronomer. Mm. Uh, they would do things like code heavily or like do mm. lots of really mm. intricate calculations and derivations, and I was like, this, this isn't helpful for them. So I designed my own curriculum where each lesson was devoted to a different skill uh, that I thought scientists use every day in their work and everyone else could also benefit from using, no matter what they did. Uh, so I, I taught that, it went well. Uh, I, I, have, I, I really loved my students, they were really great, but I had one class uh, where at the beginning of the semester a few students really could not rearrange an equation, just like mm. high school algebra, they couldn't rearrange an equation to solve Columbia it. undergrads? Yeah. Interesting. Because uh, well, they, were, they were humanities majors, sure. and so they, it, this just wasn't where their focus was. And by the end of the semester, not only could they do that, but I, I gave them a piece of data. I actually gave them a light curve for an exoplanet, which is what I study, a planet mm -hmm. outside of our solar system. And I didn't tell them what I wanted them to find. I didn't tell them how to find it, but I said, here's some data. What do you think is interesting here? What do you think you could learn from it? And they came up with that. They realized that they could find the, the period of the planet and how hot or cold the planet might be. And then they came up with the equations themselves wow. to find those numbers. That's amazing. I mean, you, you also got to wonder if you equip people from outside of the discipline with the skills they need to make inferences about data mm -hmm. in astronomy or astrophysics, like are there things that we're missing just because we're not looking at it with the right lens? Yeah, probably. That's one of the reasons people give for why we should have a more diverse field is that mm -hmm. uh, if you get people from diverse backgrounds, you'll have people with diverse perspectives and they'll be able to look at the data and information differently. And that's, that's definitely true. That Those students I had who uh, had never prioritized learning how to solve a system of equations, they definitely looked at the data differently than I would as someone who's just been brought up academically in that, in that world. And I think what's interesting about how a lot of people are exposed to science are through you know, science fiction movies, <laughs> right, or fantasy. And another one of the really interesting things about you is like you have this teaching framework, mm -hmm. sounds critical and sounds like it has amazing results, but also most people aren't necessarily going to be exposed to that. So one of the things that you like doing is consulting movies on how to be more scientifically accurate. Well, it's something I'd like to do. I haven't really done, done it yet. Um, but yeah, one of my biggest pet peeves is mm -hmm. when any sort of media presents itself or at least doesn't explicitly not present itself as scientifically mm. inaccurate. Mm -hmm. uh, because people do learn a lot from movies, and so they'll see something in a movie, and if it's not very clear that it's false, they'll take away from that experience that this inaccurate thing is true. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to have people working with m movie directors and writers and authors, anyone who makes any sort of media, to help them make their media as accurate as possible, or at least like have a disclaimer, or mm -hmm. you know, there are some things that are so ridiculous I'm not mad about. Like, like no what? one is looking at Rick and Morty and thinking that it's scientific. They can't accurate. build the portal gun, <laughs> right? Or, or like Galaxy Quest. Like no mm -hmm. one looks at those things and thinks that they can actually learn something from it. But movies mm -hmm. like Gravity mm -hmm. or The Martian or Interstellar, which to varying degrees are scientifically accurate, people look at those and think that they're real representations of what space actually is. What's one thing that we can correct for people who saw Interstellar and were like, all right. I've actually never like, seen Interstellar. Okay. Uh, but mean, one me of neither, my, <laughs> not all the way through. Right. Um, in general, something that I, I see, there are two things that I see mm -hmm. everyone get wrong. Mm -hmm. The first is that people always put sound in space. Like if there are big space battles, they put mm -hmm. explosions and uh, you can hear things whizzing by. That's, that's not happening. Space is a vacuum. Uh, so there aren't enough molecules to bump into each other to actually move sound waves. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one big thing. The other is that when people travel in space, they you see those stars whooshing past, mm -hmm. those like streams of stars. Wait, that's not what happens? Like no. Everything <laughs> in space is so far away from each mm -hmm. other that you would have to be moving like, faster speed. than the speed of light mm -hmm. almost to, to see that happening. The 
the nearest star to us is four light years away. And I don't know what that is in miles, but it means that as fast as light is, mm -hmm. it would take light four years to get from our sun to the closest star. And people, that, that means like, even if you're moving at the speed of light, that star wouldn't whoosh by you. It would take you four years to, to, for it to pass you by. So uh, that's the special the effects of that would be probably more boring. Yeah, exactly. And I, so I, I see why they take artistic mm -hmm. liberty with it. Uh, it makes things a lot prettier and a lot more interesting, but it's, it, it means that people have such a distorted view of how big and spread apart space is. Mm -hmm. One of the series that my brother really likes, um, I guess you can say maybe almost for like the human side of it, is Star Trek. And mm -hmm. I think I caught that. I, I'm not sure. Would you call yourself a Trekkie? Oh, or? yeah. Yeah, definitely so, would. So his, he also loves Voyager and Captain Janeway, and you like Belana Torres. I do. Yeah. Yeah, she, she's a half Klingon, half human, but like half black woman mm. in a powerful role who got there in a, in a kind of unconventional way. What's not to like? That's true. And I think one of the reasons I personally like Star Trek is like they take these pseudo-scientific concepts, but they also apply an element of sociology to it, mm -hmm. anthropology, and they really try to, it feels like empathy is a common theme. And you know, when we, whole separate discussion, but like when we explore space and as we continue to advance, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we can't forget about, whether we're bu building a telescope um, on a mountain in, in Hawaii or like, you know, the co space colonization, it seems like a far off concept, but if humans are the ones that are doing the exploration, like it's a very important thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm when we're actually doing the exploring. Yeah, uh, scientists are always trying to forget that science is done by people, and so mm -hmm. it has all of humanity's like biases and, and ugliness involved. Mm -hmm. uh, especially astronomers, we like to think that because we're not working directly with people or solving things, or like de developing things that will directly impact human lives, that like it, it doesn't matter how we think about people. Uh, but that, that's so not true. All you have to, there are so many examples of things that you can look at. The TMT is just the most recent one mm -hmm. of ways that astronomers are directly impacting real human lives and, and ways that we, we really need to think about more intentionally. For sure. Maybe let's, um, let's end. One of the things uh, I subscribed after we met, I subscribed to your newsletter, which is, I think you just reached your 100th fun fact. I did. So congrats on that. Thank so, I mean, what's great about it is there are a lot of things that people take for granted in understanding like what outer space is or like how the parts of it work. Like what's maybe one fun fact that people should know that they probably don't. And I'm sure it's like all hundred fun facts, <laughs> but you know, what's, what was maybe, what was the hundredth fact that, that you ended on? The hundredth fact was the end of the universe. I thought it was pretty fitting. Mm. Um, so there, there are three theories that have kind of risen to the top of how we think the universe might end. Um, the, the first is that, so I want to back up and give a little bit more background information. Uh, the universe is expanding mm -hmm. and it's expanding at, a, at an accelerating rate. So it's getting bigger and it's getting bigger faster all the time. Uh, and so there are three ways that that could possibly end. Uh, one way is called the big crunch, I think. Big and crunch. so the, the universe expands until it can't expand anymore and gravity will eventually overcome this mysterious force called dark energy that is making it expand, then it'll crunch back in on itself. Mm. Uh, the, the next one is called the, like the, free, the heat death or like the big freeze. And the idea is that things will eventually get so far apart that uh, everything becomes less dense, things stop moving, things just very slowly freeze to death, mm. really. Uh, because as the universe expands, it is getting colder on average. Um, and so that's, that's one way that it might end. And then the third is called the big rip. Uh, and that's the mm. idea that the universe is going to continue to expand at an accelerating rate forever until things just rip apart. Mm. Uh, and even the, the like, particles that are bound together will rip apart because space between them will expand so much. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen because we don't know enough about dark energy and how it works and how it is propelling the expansion of the universe. Mm. And dark energy is different than dark matter? It is, yeah. Dark matter uh, is just regular matter that doesn't... Well, actually, we don't know what it's made of, but it's, mm. it's 
very similar to regular matter in that it can interact gravitationally. You can see the way that it will pull things uh, with its gravity, but it just doesn't interact with light. Mm. Uh, and so that's, that's why we call it dark matter, because we can't see it. So we know pretty much everything about dark matter except what it's made of. Mm. We know how it acts, how it behaves. Uh, we can predict what it's going to do. We know pretty much nothing about dark energy. And that's an active area of research right now, trying to figure out what it is, how it works, why it's doing what it is, uh, what it's going to do in the future. So. Cool. Well, really appreciate you being with us today. Um, this was really educational for me. Hopefully the folks watching learn a lot too. And yeah, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course.